Humans have an incredible capacity to improve their strength with certain types of exercise, most often through resistance training. But what actually happens inside the body when you get stronger? And what's the best training protocol to accomplish this? Often you hear that if you want to get stronger, you have to get bigger. And yes, it is true that often a bigger muscle is a stronger muscle. However, you can actually get significant strength improvements without much or any increases in muscular size or muscular hypertrophy. So today, we're going to explain the different strength adaptations that occur with getting stronger by getting bigger versus getting stronger without putting on much size. And we're gonna do this by showing you some awesome relevant anatomy by taking you from the brain, through the nerves, and into the muscles. And of course, talk about some of the training protocols to improve your strength. So, let's do this. So let me first start by asking, why in the world would anyone not want to get bigger and stronger at the same time? Well, there are plenty of athletes where they may want to be as strong as possible without putting on much weight. Or in other words, their strength to body weight ratio is important. This is also known as relative strength, which is a measure of how strong an individual is in say like a particular lift or movement compared to their body weight. Like having a high relative strength would be very beneficial for say something like a vertical jump. Also, there are sports where people have to be in certain weight classes, so they may want to maximize their strength at that weight. But what is muscular strength? Muscular strength is about how much force your muscles can produce, and we most often represent this by someone's one rep max, the greatest amount of weight you could lift one time. And obviously today, we're going to talk about how you can improve that. Now earlier I mentioned that we were going to take you from the brain, through the nerves, and into the muscles. And what we'll see is that we can get adaptations in multiple places along this chain. And when I say into the muscles, we're going to go deep inside of the muscles to show you how the muscle contracts, as well as certain intracellular adaptations that improve without increasing the size of the muscle fiber. It's ridiculously awesome. So let's get into the brain. When you decide to contract a muscle, this starts all the way up in the brain in the motor cortex, which is this fold, or what we refer to as a gyrus on the posterior aspect of the frontal lobe. The signal will move from the motor cortex through a neuron called an upper motor neuron, which travels down the spinal cord, and this upper motor neuron will eventually synapse with a lower motor neuron at a specific segment of the spinal cord, depending on the muscle we're sending the signal to. For example, if this signal is going to the biceps brachii, this synapse between the upper and lower motor neuron would occur at C5 or C6 spinal cord levels. If the signal were going to a lower muscle like the quads, this synapse would occur at the L2, L3, or L4 spinal levels. But after this synapse occurs, the axon of the lower motor neuron, and therefore the continuation of this signal, will travel through a spinal nerve until it reaches its target muscle, where it will then synapse with specific muscle fibers that make up that target muscle, and this causes those muscle fibers to contract. Now let's pause right here for a second and connect some more dots. That lower motor neuron that connected to a certain amount of muscle fibers within the whole muscle is called a motor unit. Or the textbook definition that I will often give my students is, a motor unit is the motor neuron and the muscle fibers it controls. But with our example, we only activated one lower motor neuron and therefore one motor unit, which means we only activated a small amount of the total number of muscle fibers within that whole muscle. And so this is only going to generate a minimal amount of force. And so this is how motor unit recruitment works. If I lift something light, I need fewer muscle fibers to do that, so I only need to recruit a few motor units. But if I want to lift something heavy, I need more muscle fibers to be activated within the muscle. And so then I would start by activating more upper motor neurons in that motor cortex, which would then in turn activate more lower motor neurons that form the motor units with those muscle fibers. And I would generate more force or lift something heavier. So hopefully you are seeing that the force exerted by a muscle during a contraction depends on the number of motor units recruited. Not only does it depend on the number of motor units recruited, but it also depends on the rate or how fast those signals can be sent to the muscle. A faster signal generally means more force. And this is where we see one of our first improvements in strength without the muscles undergoing hypertrophy. Because with specific types of training, which we'll get into later, your nervous system 
This pathway that we just discussed gets more efficient at recruiting motor units. It does this by getting better with recruiting more motor units simultaneously on demand as well as by increased synchronization of those motor units. When you first start strength training, your muscle fibers might not fire in perfect sequence or in a perfectly coordinated manner. But as you continue to train, your nervous system gets better at synchronizing those motor units, working together more efficiently, and all of this results in more force generated by the muscle without getting any bigger. So now let's move on to the next physiological adaptation that can result in improved strength. And in order to do this, we're going to zoom into the synaptic connection between the end of that lower motor neuron and the cell membrane of a muscle fiber. And the synaptic connection is referred to as the neuromuscular junction. And as you can see, they're not technically connected. There's actually a space between the end of that lower motor neuron and the cell membrane of the muscle fiber. And that space is referred to as the synaptic cleft. And as an FYI, the cell membrane of a muscle fiber is referred to as the sarcolemma. But if we look at the inside of the end of that lower motor neuron, we can see these bag-like structures called synaptic vesicles. And within these synaptic vesicles, there's a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. And when that signal gets sent down that lower motor neuron, the synaptic vesicles release the acetylcholine into that synaptic cleft. And then those acetylcholine molecules will bind to the acetylcholine receptors embedded in the membrane of that muscle fiber. And this will then cause ion channels to open up and sodium will rush into the muscle fiber. And this creates an action potential and eventually leads to the muscle fiber contracting. Now we'll get into a little bit more of that in just a second. But right here at the neuromuscular junction, we can get physiological adaptations that can result in improved strength. That lower motor neuron can get more efficient at releasing the acetylcholine. And within that synaptic cleft, we have certain enzymes that are in charge of breaking down the acetylcholine so that it can be recycled and put back into that lower motor neuron, this process of reuptake. And this whole process can also get more efficient. So just having changes at the neuromuscular junction can also result in improved strength. So now let's go inside the muscle fiber to learn how a muscle fiber contracts. And of course, this will help us to understand some other physiological adaptations that result in strength. And if we go to the inside of a muscle fiber, we'll see that it's made up of multiple, multiple contractile protein subunits called sarcomeres. And sarcomeres are stacked end to end to end to end in sequence, kind of creating this string of sarcomeres. And a string of sarcomeres is referred to as a myofibril. Now, if we just focus in on one sarcomere, we can get a great understanding of how a muscle fiber actually contracts. And we're going to focus on three proteins that make up the sarcomere. There's more than three, but these three are the most important for our story. The first one is myosin. And if you look at this picture, you can see one myosin molecule or one myosin protein. And to me, it looks like two golf clubs twisted together. If you can kind of see that analogy or stretch this analogy with me, you can see the myosin heads would be where you'd actually hit the golf ball, where the myosin tails would be the actual shafts of the golf club, and they're kind of twisted together. Now, all of the myosin molecules bundled together create a thick filament within the sarcomere. So multiple myosin molecules bundled together equals thick filament in sarcomere. But then the other protein we want to take a look at is actin. One actin molecule or actin protein is one like circular ball that you're seeing in this picture. And you can see that there's multiple actin molecules strung together. It almost looks like two strings twisted. And all those actin molecules twisted together on that string creates the thin filament. So myosin bundled together makes a thick filament. All the actin molecules strung together equals the thin filament. Now you'll notice that thin filament also has another protein associated with it. This protein wrapping around the thin filament is called TTC or troponin tropomyosin complex. And what's really interesting about this whole interaction between these three proteins is I often will tell my students, myosin is in love with actin. Myosin wants nothing more than to bind to actin and cuddle, or what we'll refer to as ratcheting a little bit later on. But TTC, you could kind of think of them as the protective parents of actin. They don't want myosin cuddling and ratcheting with actin. They're trying to protect it. So when you see TTC covering up the binding sites of actin, that's when a sarcomere is in a resting state. But for us to understand how a muscle fiber contracts, we need to go back to the neuromuscular junction, where we learned that that lower motor neuron released acetylcholine, 
and the acetylcholine would bind to the acetylcholine receptors in the membrane of the muscle fiber. And when this occurred, it caused ion channels within the membrane of the muscle fiber to open up and sodium would rush into the muscle fiber, creating an action potential. Now, if you don't feel like we've gone into the weeds enough, we could go further into the weeds when we talk about the action potential that occurs with muscle fibers, but we're gonna save that for another video. Today, what we need to know is that when this action potential occurs, it affects a specific structure within the muscle fiber called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this sarcoplasmic reticulum is in close proximity and wraps around these sarcomeres, and it contains calcium. So when the action potential occurs, it causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release the calcium, and then calcium binds to TTC. And when calcium binds to TTC, it causes the TTC to change its shape just enough to slightly move out of the way and expose those binding sites on actin. And what will myosin do as soon as those binding sites are exposed on actin? Myosin's going to bind and ratchet, or what we kind of referred to as cuddling earlier. But you can see that ratcheting, or some bo books will refer to it as the power stroke, that's gonna pull and start to shorten the sarcomere. And what's interesting about this bond between myosin and actin is that it requires a high energy molecule, ATP, to actually break that bond. So we burn an ATP, the myosin will release and actually reset the head, but then bind to a further down actin molecule and ratchet again. Use another ATP, reset, bind further down and ratchet again. And you can see that would shorten by ratcheting and ratcheting and ratcheting the overall sarcomere and therefore shorten the overall muscle fiber. And what's crazy to think about is there are multiple myosin heads, multiple actin molecules doing this within each individual sarcomere and it's just happening ridiculously fast. Like every time I'm moving a muscle, these sarcomeres are shortening and I just can't keep up with it. But this whole idea of what's happening with the muscle contraction, and now that we understand it a little bit more fully, this can help us to learn some more physiological adaptations that occur with improvements in strength. Now, one way to get stronger with this whole process that we just learned is that you could increase the number of contractile proteins within the muscle fiber. Increase the amount of myosin and actin, and you're going to be able to generate more force. However, if you make more myosin and actin, this is going to take up space and therefore increase the overall size of the muscle. And again, this often happens with people who are doing certain types of resistance training. They get muscular hypertrophy going hand in hand with increases in muscular strength. However, it has been shown with certain types of strength training that you can have improved contractility of the sarcomeres and therefore generate more force independent of increases in muscular size. Or in other words, the sarcomeres and the contractile proteins that you do have start to contract more forcefully without making more of them. And there are a few reasons for this. One is the speed and efficiency at which the calcium is released and recycled with the sarcoplasmic reticulum increases. Also, there's evidence that suggests the bond between myosin and actin also gets stronger, which of course I just think is great with my love story analogy because the more time these two spend together connecting and pulling on each other, the stronger that bond gets and they cuddle and ratchet even harder, producing more force and strength for the muscle. Now we do also need to address that some strength improvements can come from some of the slow twitch muscle fibers converting to more of a fast twitch fiber. In general, we say that slow twitch fibers are great at resisting fatigue, so they are great for endurance activities. However, they don't generate as much force. Whereas the fast twitch fibers, not great at resisting fatigue, but they contract with more velocity and force. So some conversion of the slow twitch to fast twitch fibers can also explain improvements in one's overall strength. So what are some of the important training protocols that are more specific to improving some of these strength adaptations? First, you typically wanna pick compound movements. These are movements that involve multiple joints, such as the squat, deadlift, bench press, shoulder press, rows, pull-ups, etc. And to stimulate these strength adaptations, the rep and set scheme is also going to need to be of a higher quality and higher intensity. So this will usually consist of three to five sets per exercise with a load or a weight that you could only perform about two to five repetitions with. It is also helpful to try to move the load as quickly as possible without, of course, sacrificing form, control, or safety. Now the reality is that with these heavy loads, you aren't going to move the weight that fast. But it has been shown that if you consciously try to move the weight as fast as possible, 
Even though it isn't going to look like it's moving much faster, this has been shown to recruit more motor units and stimulate these nervous system strength adaptations that we've been discussing so far. So imagine a controlled lowering of the squat and you attempting to stand up or press the weight up as quickly as possible. Again, with maintaining form control and safety. And because we are going for higher intensity and higher quality, rest is usually at least two to three minutes between sets. And you could even push that to three to five minutes if you have the extra time, as this would just enhance the quality of each high intensity set. But you aren't going to sacrifice that much as far as long-term adaptations are concerned if you have limited time and you can only rest for that two to three minutes. One other thing to keep in mind is that due to this type of training being of a higher intensity and neurologically demanding, you usually need a few days to recover before doing another session that uses the same muscle groups and movement patterns. That will vary a little bit from person to person based on recovery capabilities. So some may only need 48 hours to recover while others may need 72 hours or more. Now, as far as progression, a good rule of thumb would be to increase the intensity by about three to 5% per week, which usually comes in the form of adding more weight, as well as a three to 5% increase in the volume. That volume could come in the form of additional sets or maybe even squeezing one or two extra workouts in per month. You would also want to consider a deload week every five to six weeks or so where you decrease the intensity for that week. That could come with fewer sets and or slightly lighter loads. Now as cool as it is to be able to increase strength without changing muscular size much, it is important to note that eventually you'll get to a point where you maximize the strength with the muscular size that you have, which means you will get to the point where you will need to get some increases in muscular size in order to continue to get stronger. And this is when people at the end of their strength-based workouts could throw in some sets and exercises that are more dedicated to stimulating hypertrophy. Generally, this includes higher reps and more volume, which we'll definitely get more into with part two to this video. And as always, thanks for watching everyone. Hopefully you learned some new and interesting information about strength adaptations. If you wanna learn more about other adaptations that can occur from exercise, we'll link some pretty cool videos here. And like and subscribe if you feel the need, and I'll see some of you down in the comments.